sticks out this morning in the songs we just sang. Lord, bind my wandering heart to you. Anyone have a problem with a a wandering heart? Just curious, just a few of us. So, you know, it's such a great truth to be reminded of is we are faithless at times, but the Bible says God is more than faithful. Is that not an awesome truth? That he is uh, 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 able to go above and beyond our wildest imagination in how he takes care of us and ministers to us. And even when we wander, he never goes anywhere. He's always there. He's always consistent. So, amen. Amen. Good to be with you. Before we dive into the word this morning, number one, I'm feeling good. Thank you for your prayers. And I appreciate it. I feel like a new man, even though I have seasonal asthma. So if I'm coughing a little bit, it's only because I'm struggling for breath. And if I turn blue, um, go ahead and do CPR. It's, it's going to be okay. So uh, it shouldn't happen. I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, that's weird. But uh, we'll dive into the word here in a moment. But speaking of prayer, let's pray for each other. We haven't done this in a while. And so what we're going to do is I'm, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and, and share necessarily what you're struggling with. But I'm going to just call out some just topics where if you're struggling or you're just really seeking God's heart in this area of your life, Uh, We would just love to have you stand up where you're at, and then those around you will just lay hands on you, and we'll have someone pray. And uh, we are to pray for one another. That is one of the gifts that we are able to extend to one another as a community, as a family. The Bible says, number one, pray without ceasing, meaning don't give up praying, but also to pray for one another. And Galatians says, and to bear one another's burdens. See, this is more than just audience stage, your spectators, we're doing the business. We are all part of this thing called the church. And believe it or not, the church is not an organization. It is an organism living and active. And we have a responsibility to bear one another's burdens. And so if you came for the show, I'm sorry, but it's more than that. Amen. We are called to pray for one another. And so one of the ways we can do that is just to acknowledge that there are things going on in our lives. Like if I call out a topic right now like health, like who here is just struggling with some health-related issues? There might be things you're just going, that's going on right now, just seasonal stuff, and you're like, God, I want to get out of this funk. Now there's good funk and there's bad funk, right? And we just want to get out of the funk. or, Or maybe there's something going on with you and you're not sure what it is. Even your physician is at a loss and you're sitting there going... God, I would just love to know something specific. If you're struggling right now in the area of health, if you're sick or you're just seeking wisdom, just stand up where you're at. Just stand up. And what we're going to do is we're just going to have people around you. Just, just everyone stand up. Just lay hands. Just if you're near these people, just lay hands on them. And we want you to just acknowledge what is going on in your life. While we may not know specifics, God knows and uh, can I just have, you know, Becky Ferguson, can I have you pray? Can I have you pray for these that are just struggling with health issues right now? Thank you, Becky. And then with your, in your hearts, just unite with what Becky's going to pray, and we're going to be in one accord on this topic. Amen. 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 Um, maybe this is a time of year where uh, you're struggling with your, your job. You may be out of work. You're looking for work. You may, your work, your job may be questionable. You're not sure what's going to happen after the holidays. Uh, you're just seeking wisdom and you're seeking direction. Maybe you're seeking provision like you, you have needs and it doesn't seem like God's providing for your needs. And if that's you, anything work related or job related, just stand up where you're at. And again, we just want to acknowledge that. We want to acknowledge the, the mystery. We want to acknowledge the uncertainty. Uh, so if you're struggling with something regarding a job, a uh, lack of a job, or maybe a change of uh, employment, just stand up right where you're at right now. Okay. Everyone, gather around Zach, because he's the only one that stood up. So we're, this is called the love bomb. We're going to go love bomb Zach right now. So no, Tim, uh, would you just go ahead and pray for, uh, for Zach and, and anyone else that might be struggling with this area? Hmm. Yeah. 
Amen. If you haven't yet figured it out, God cares not just for the big stuff going on, but for the small stuff going on in our lives. And, you know, I want to just, let's pray for those maybe struggling with something within. Maybe there's some sort of addiction. Maybe there's some sort of, uh, um, almost like a, an enslavement to something, and you just want to get free of it. And I don't know if it's, if it's alcohol-related or drug-related or, or um, porn or, or, you know, the enemy would love just to have that snare on your life. And, uh, you know, you're here for a reason, and God is more powerful than any sin that may entangle you. And so uh, let's, if you're struggling with something and, and you just want to stand up and just say, I just need prayer. And we don't know what it is, but God knows. Just stand up right where you're at. I know this is a big, this is a big one, but just go ahead and stand up right where you're at. So anyone else? Anyone else just need prayer in this area? Okay. Stand up, church. Let's, let's lay hands. Let's just extend our hands. Uh, Ron Leofow, can I have you pray for these? Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's let's finish with this one, and this is probably a big one, especially this time of year, and that is just the fight for joy around the holidays. Um, you know, we have, what, eight days until Christmas, and for a lot of people, it's all like, you know, let's just hop and skip and be excited about things, and for a lot of people, this is just a depressing time of year. You know who you have to spend Christmas with, and it doesn't excite you, um, and, and you need to fight for joy. Uh, because you're going to be with people that you have a hard time loving. Maybe there's issues there. Maybe there's some unforgiveness. Maybe there's some bitterness there. Uh, maybe you need to fight for joy because this is a holiday season that's going to be different than years past because there's maybe a loss of a loved one. Uh, who knows what it is, but we don't want to blanket this holiday with this pure white driven snow and act as if there's not dirt underneath that snow. Amen? Amen. We want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, Christmas, you know, as portrayed in the media and by our neighbors, sometimes is fraught not with delight, but with difficulty. And so if you're in that place and you're just fighting for joy this season, just stand up right where you're at. And let's just be honest, right? Let's just be real and not pretend like, ho, 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 it's all just good, right? I do that pretty good. Right? The ho came from the bellows within, right? So. Uh, if you're struggling to fight for joy this season, we want to pray for you. Just stand up right where you're at, and then church, gather around those that have stood, and just put your hands on them, and, and I'll go ahead and, and pray. Lord, thank you for meeting us in the realness of life. Lord, we know that life does not go uh, according to our plans, and, uh, and we struggle sometimes to, to know the joy and to know the, the happiness and the and the delights of this season, and uh, Lord, you know where many of these people are at and what they're wrestling with, and, and I pray that somehow what they're seeking would be more than satisfied in you, more than just an experience, may they know you and your presence, more than the feelings, Lord, would you just speak to their hearts and minds and give them confidence and assurance and certainty that though things may not be where they want them to be, you are a God that has them where you want them. And you love them and you care for them more than they could ever imagine. So to help them discover the joy, help them reminded of who they are uh, in Christ. And Lord, pray that this is a holiday season like none other, because you are involved in it. So Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this family, for hearing our prayers. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. And like Ryan had already said uh, this morning, if there's anything that you desire prayer for, go ahead and use that communication card that's in your program, and we want to be able to come alongside of you and
and pray for you. And the leadership gets those prayer requests every week. And uh, we would love just to be able to lift you up in, in prayer. So turn your, yes. Right. Amen. Praise God. Awesome. Let's pray that thing closes, right? There goes my getaway next summer to your, your house in Albuquerque. I'll have to find something else. So, yeah. Praise God for that. And let us know when it's all final so then we can really be like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ron will be jump. He'll be playing bass. He won't be back here. Just He'll be like. <laughs> yeah. Matthew chapter 1. Turn in your Bibles there if you would. And uh, believe it or not, there is a bigger topic right now than Star Wars. I, I know, I know that's hard to believe, right? Uh, yeah, I know, Star Wars, that, that small little film that opened this week. And who hasn't seen it yet? Because there's spoilers happening, right? No, just, just kidding. So it's going to be a polarizing movie. I'm going to tell you right now, I loved it. I think it's one of the best in the franchise. Uh, and uh, if you wanted to disagree with me, it's all right. You could be wrong. Uh, you've probably been wrong many times before. Uh, it is fantastic. But bigger topic in the Star Wars, uh, this person named Jesus. I'm just putting it out there, right? Jesus Christ is the biggest topic. And no, he's not part of the dark side. He is not the Sith Lord. He's better than that. So um, this is a season where so many hearts and minds are directed toward the manger, Bethlehem, Jesus. And like I mentioned before, you know, it'd be easy to sterilize it and, and make it so pure and so innocent. And, and if we truly understand the narrative of Christmas, it, it's a mess, right? I'm watching my wife's Christmas production on Friday night. She's a, she's a music teacher at her kid's school. She put on this production. It was fantastic. And what I love is, you know, seeing the execution of this thing and all the hard work she uh, poured into this. And, but, you know, when you're working with kids, you never know what's going to happen, right? So the show Friday night starts with the preschoolers, which is always a riot because you spend so much time preparing and you're thinking, like, these kids got it. And the parents are there and they're filming and they're excited. And just, just you know, before you know it, there's one little girl who decides in the middle of the production just to lift up her dress and, and, and just, just show everyone her, her, her underneath, right? You know, like, and the, you can just imagine what the parents would be like, oh, great, that's my child, right? All the other parents are laughing, but her parents are going, oh, Lord, please help us, you know? And then there's the kid, the little boy over here, who's just got his hands down his pants the whole time, and he's just like, and the parents are like, get your head down your pants, <laughs> Right? And then there's the one kid who, all during rehearsals, right, he's the one singing and smiling, but when showtime means go time, it's no time in his book. He's just sitting there like this the whole time going, and the parents are like, move your hand, move your hand, and he just doesn't want to have any part of it, right? Just when you want something to, to go off perfectly, you just know that there's human beings involved and it's going to be a mess. And I know it's not just true for, for that production, but all these other parents that are posting stuff on social media, you know, there's the kid, there's my son, and all of a sudden he decides to pick his nose during one of the, like the, the pinnacle moments of the play, and you're just like, no, really? And we sit there and go, yeah, really? Because as much as we want Christmas to be perfect, and we want the, 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 the execution of the holiday to be without spot and without blemish, we have to realize that this is life, right? We all mess up, right? We all have our hands in our pants when we shouldn't have our hands in our pants. We're all lifting our dresses when we shouldn't lift our dresses. We're all picking our nose when we shouldn't pick our noses. And that's the reality of it. And I want you to know that there is a God out there who in the Christmas narrative shows us that it's just not all, you know, pure and perfect. It's a mess. And today we're going to address that topic through the character of Joseph. See, the interesting thing about Joseph is this. For me personally, I've read so little on this man who ends up being the earthly dad to Jesus. Now, can you imagine that job? Who wants that role, right? Like, Joseph, you're going to raise this kid. It's like, uh, can, do I have an option in this whole thing? Like, but not only that, I have never heard a message on the person of Joseph. And yet there's enough in the Bible 
that gives us some fascinating insight into this character, Joseph. And I'm going to tell you something. This guy navigated the messiness of his day and the coming of Jesus via his virgin wife, Mary, in ways that I think are going to, it's going to encourage us. See, Jesus did not enter the world at the most perfect time, meaning everything was orderly, everything was in place. Jesus came at a time when things were in upheaval. And yet that's when God shows up in our lives. Not when things are all together and perfect, not when you have all your ducks in a row, but God shows up when things are a mess to remind us that that's okay. Because even though we may not have perspective and think it's all going to work out, God always will make sure, especially for those who love him, it's all going to work out. So we turn to Matthew chapter 1. And one thing you are going to know is that while there's so little written about Joseph and you know, there's not, there's not part of the Christmas story that we talk about Joseph a lot. There's not a lot of songs that we sing that involve Joseph. There's no recorded words of Joseph in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does Joseph say anything. So how do we piece together a life and try to get into this man's heart when really there's nothing recorded that he's ever said? Well, let's talk about the circumstances. Let's talk about the situations. Because what we have here, I believe, is enough. And I'm going to tell you right now that each time God sends Joseph a message through an angel, there's one quality that stands out. He obeys immediately. Every time a message comes to him via God through an angel, he obeys immediately immediately so our legacy of this forgotten man at the manger is not necessarily in what he said but in what he did and i think it's going to encourage your hearts today and i will tell you that everything in the christmas narrative hinges on this man's obedience as you're going to see in the accounts this morning so matthew chapter 1 look at verse 18 it says this Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, circle that word betrothed, before they came together, she was found to be with the child by the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 18 is is quite a verse. There's a lot there, and I want you to stop and consider something. Number one is the the idea of betrothal in this time. This is more than engagement. In our culture, you know, when a, when a man and woman come together and they want to pursue a life together in marriage, we enter this uh, stage called engagement. You know, a ring goes on the finger, there's a promise to work towards marriage, and, 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 and really that's all it is. But in this culture, engagement uh, and this whole idea of betrothal was much more legally and socially binding. Literally, when they are betrothed, they could be called husband and wife. The only difference was that they did not live together. They would be betrothed for one year. They would be legally husband and wife. But for 12 months, they would prepare their home for marriage. So during this 12 months, Joseph would focus on making the house ready for his wife and family. Mary would be busy making the wedding garments and clothes. And Mary's family would be ready in planning the party. Now, can you imagine how epic a party is? This is going to be 12 months of planning, right? Like, they're pulling out all the stops. This is going to be quite the fiesta. So Joseph's focused on the home. Mary's focused on the clothes. And Mary's family's focused on the party. So here they are, legally married, without going through that final stage of the actual ceremony when they will be now brought together and live under one roof. So she's betrothed to Joseph. Verse 18 says, And then all of a sudden, she is found to be with child by means of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to talk about more the Mary lessons next week. But can you imagine being a woman who has had no relationship with a man, an intimate sexual relationship with a man, who now God shows up via an angel and says, Mary, you're going to become pregnant. This is going to be a work of God, and you're going to conceive. I can't imagine the flood of thoughts going through her head, right? So now let me piece a gap in here. See, between verses 18 and 19, something happens. 
According to Luke chapter 1, Mary gets this message and she immediately goes to see her relative Elizabeth. Many think Elizabeth is her cousin. They're family, they're blood relatives. Now at this time, Elizabeth's pregnant with somebody. Anyone know who she's pregnant with? John the Baptist. John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins. So Mary goes to spend time at Elizabeth's house, and the moment she walks in the door, Elizabeth says, you're pregnant, and you're pregnant with the Messiah. What? Like, thanks for ruining the, the news. I was going to spill this to you all, and you, you know. And Mary stays with Elizabeth for three months. Can you imagine the conversations her and her relative is ha- are, they're having at this moment? Like, I wonder if Mary in her mind is not only thinking about what am I carrying inside me right now, but number two, how am I going to tell Joseph about this? Three months, she's at Elizabeth's house. At the end of three months, she goes back to Nazareth where her and Joseph are living. Now, imagine the conversation, right? Joseph, uh, I need to meet you at that olive tree where we committed our, our love to one another, can we, can we meet there? And he's like, sure, let's meet there. So they meet at the olive tree, right? And I'm just speculating, and here's the conversation. Joseph, I, I need to tell you something. I'm pregnant. Now, can you imagine him, like, just maybe kind of stumbling a little bit, like, okay, what? Y- you're pregnant? Like, all of a sudden, there's this things being played out in his head, like, I, I never pegged you as the unfaithful type. I never pegged you as the kind of person that would be, you know, unfaithful to me. And the the time I've known you, just like this is, and you can just imagine, he's just got this flood of thoughts going through his head. And then she says, but that's not it. That's not it! As if that's not like a, just this heartbreaking news, right? She says to him, but you need to know I haven't been unfaithful to you. Okay, wait, what? What? You're pregnant, but you haven't slept with somebody else? Like, at this moment, it's like National Enquirer story, right? Like, an alien made me pregnant. Like, where is she going to go with this? And she says, what you need to know is that I'm pregnant, and this has been a work of God in me. Now you just got, you're like in a whole different category. How do you even process something like this? See, what you need to know is Joseph, he's pretty knowledgeable in his theology and in his Bible and what the prophets and Moses and the law have have taught. He's thinking to himself, where in the Bible is something like this? You need to know, Joseph, I'm pregnant and what is going on inside me is a work of God. So the first news, there's this question of adultery. The second news is this question of blasphemy. Really? God dwelling within you? And all of a sudden, and here he is scratching his head. None of this makes sense. He's searching his mind going, nothing I see in Scripture. Can, can I be alone right now? Right? Would, would you blame Joseph for just saying, can I just get some time for me? And you can imagine, so they're in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is a, is a cool little town kind of on this hillside overlooking this valley. And I'm sure there's some amazing hiking trails. And I'm sure J- Joseph knows this area like the back of his hand. He just is like, you know what? I need to go figure things out. So he goes and he goes and he meditates and he goes and reflects. And, and honestly, there's two options available to him. Write these down in your notes if you would. There's two options available to him. The Bible says, According to the law, if his wife has been unfaithful, he can bring that to the authorities. She could be found guilty of adultery and she could be stoned to death. So option number one is have her stoned and killed. Option number two is that he could seek a legal divorce because of her infidelity. She's pregnant, so let's just divorce. Those are the two options on the table But something you're going to see here in verse 19 is interesting. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, involved in who this guy is, he's righteous and he's kind. Here's the woman he is betrothed to. This is his wife. Does he want to have her killed? 
Does he want to divorce her? He is confused. And he decides what to do. And he gets the best sleep he can that night. Can you imagine the grief and how exhausted he is trying to process this whole deal? You ever been in a place yourself where something has been dropped into your lap and you're just searching for wisdom? You're searching from, for some sort of explanation. And so notice what the Bible says. So here's Joseph, verse 19, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her. Here's his kindness. Like he loves this woman and he doesn't want to do something to disgrace her. What does he do? So he desires to put her away secretly. I will divorce her and it will be quiet. I don't want to bring shame upon the situation, but I want to do it and I want to do it quickly. Verse 20. But when he had considered this, circle the word considered. This is a word that is heavy with meaning. It means he has meditated. He has reflected. He has spent considerable time thinking about this situation. He didn't just jump quickly into a decision. He has been processing this. And when he considered what he was going to do, he, behold, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Now, stop right there. Notice how quickly the angel showed up to Mary to tell her what's going on. Notice how long it took for God to send an angel to Joseph to give him an idea of what's happening. Can I just be honest with all this? Sometimes God gives us different messages in different times. Right? Some of us know things right away, and some of us, God says, I'm going to allow you to wait till the 11th hour. And we hate that, don't we? The uncertainty and the unknowing, and it's like, God, why are you pro prolonging, why are you delaying letting me know what I need to do? Because here's the first point in your notes. Before you seek God's will, i.e. direction for your life, you must first seek His heart. God wants to tell you what to do. He wants to direct your steps. But He will not do it divorced from relationship with Him. See, this is why he is a righteous and kind man, Joseph. This is why he didn't just make a decision like that. He spent an incredible amount of time processing the moment and just going, God, what do I do? And he felt like, and especially according to the law, that he knew what he needed to do. And even in the integrity of his heart, he made a decision. But that doesn't mean it was the right decision. This is why God intervenes. And God intervenes because he desires that relationship. Which brings us to the second point. Before God calls you to obey, he first reminds you of who you are. See, here's Joseph, this righteous and kind man. He's gone through some serious contemplation. I love how Matthew Henry says it. He says, the Lord gives guidance to the thoughtful, not to the unthinking. His mind is full of thoughts. And here's his, here's his prayer. God, what do I do? God, what do I do? But before you desire to obey, I'm going to tell you something. You need to be first reminded of who you are, your identity in Christ. Which is why the angel responds this way. Look at this. And the angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David. He roots Joseph's identity in his ancestral line. You have descended from a line of people in which the promised Messiah is going to come. See, Joseph wasn't some wealthy land magnet. He was not some, you know, great merchant. He was not some famous man in his community. He wasn't some political leader, some guy who held public office, some sort of nobility. He's this humble carpenter. And yet the angel shows up and gives him a title regarding his identity. You, Joseph, are the son of David. And he frames it in a way that reminds him of the most important thing any person can be reminded of, and that is who they are in Christ. 
Because here's the thing. If you root who you are in your obedience, you're going to be all over the map because we don't all obey perfectly, do we? That I'm looking for a response. We don't all obey perfectly, do we? No, right? Some of you are like, do I answer that? Am I allowed to say something right now? If we all look at the track record of our lives, we realize that we don't obey perfectly. And the good news is this. God knows you will not obey perfectly, yet still loves you. Why? Because like any good father with his children realizes that the kids are going to mess up. But there's always forgiveness. There's always reconciliation. Why? Not because of the faithlessness of the, of the children, but because of the faithfulness of the father. See, God wants you to know this morning that it is okay when you mess up. It's okay when you think you've made decisions and you're not sure because God wants you to know who you are in Him. And when you seek God's heart and be reminded of your identity, Ephesians 3.20 really comes into play. Write that verse down. Now to you who are able to do, to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power and his work within us. One thing your Heavenly Father always knows what's going on. He always wants to bless you. He always wants to make life better for you because God is always seeking to make your life better than you could ever make it yourself. So remember who you are. Never forget your identity in Christ. I re- I'm reminded of the Toy Story. Like I love Pixar and I love cartoons and sometimes I get more excited for these things than my own children do. And that's probably just the kid in me. But Toy Story, what's the what's the hallmark signature of the character Woody? What does he have written on the bottom of his boot? Andy. Right? Like in the Toy Story narrative, he is reminded by Buzz Lightyear That even though, Woody, you make mistakes, and even though things don't work out the way you want them to, you need to be reminded, not what you do, but who you are. Go ahead and lift up the bottom of your shoe. Whose name's written on there? Andy. So you belong to someone who loves you. And the Bible says that he has written his name on your heart, and the name written on your heart is Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you have it all, and there's nothing you could do to ever sin your way out of his love and grace. He is committed to you forever. Amen? Amen. So now, he gets the announcement. Now what? Well, a guy named Augustus, who's this Roman leader, decides it's time for a census. This is his way of collecting money, and he just decides, you know what? I've got a great get-rich-quick scheme. We're going to do the census. And all of a sudden now, every person living in the Holy Lands has to go to the ancestral city of their previous generations. For Joseph and Mary, this is a place called Bethlehem. Turn to Luke chapter 2, if you would. Luke chapter 2. So now, they have to pick up their lives. They have to disrupt the planning of the wedding. They have to do all this stuff in order to go to Bethlehem. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, Bethlehem is 100 miles from Nazareth. They just couldn't Uber their way from one city to the next. Okay? Here is an advanced pregnant woman that now is going to be on donkey or horseback and travel 100 miles to the ancestral city, which would take about 8 to 10 days. Now, we all know what it's like to travel with crabby women, amen? I mean, uh, crabby people. Now imagine a pregnant woman on horseback traveling 100 miles through the desert to go to a place they probably haven't been to in a long time, but your ancestors are from there, and you've got to be a part of the census. So you imagine the migration of people to all these cities. Bethlehem, 100 miles away, is just bustling with people. And they can't hurry. I mean, there's, there's pit stops all along the way, right? I, Joseph, guess what? I got to go to the bathroom again. Okay, here we go again, right? Like, we need to get to Bethlehem now. So they get to Bethlehem, and they're seeking for a place to stay. And we know the story, right? There's no place for them. Look at Luke chapter 2. It says, it came about in those days, Caesar Augustus issued the census. 
And all who were proceeding, verse 3, to register the city, everyone to his own city. So Joseph went from Galilee, the city of Nazareth, to Judea, called Bethlehem, right? Verse 5, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged and was with child. And it came out while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. So they make it. And yet she's ready to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now stop right there. Again, we have the account, but let's fill in some of the gaps because it's not as clean as easy as this. I mean, number one, how in the world do you end up in a filthy, unclean stable? Well, you end up there because every single place is full. The town of Bethlehem only has one room, uh, one, one location for a Best Western. You can't support two Best Westerns in Bethlehem. So there's one hotel, and then there's floor space and people that you may know. They get there late. They're there at the 11th hour. And all of a sudden, Joseph is pleading with anybody just to take him in. He's like, listen, I have this woman who's about ready to give birth, and she just needs a place to lay down. And somehow, some way, you know there's a conversation between maybe the, the innkeeper or the neighbor and some woman who just has this intuition sister and goes... This woman's going to give birth. Where can we find a spot for her? And someone's like, well, there's space in the stable. Now, Joseph is thinking to himself, my wife deserves better than this. Right? Mary is just out there. She's just holding in her tummy. She's taking deep breaths. She's like, Joseph, it's happening. Right? And he's just trying to secure a spot. Now, I don't know about you, but there was a time in our, our marriage when our kids were little and we were traveling, and I ended up getting a reservation at this really run-down joint. And, and I can't tell you the shame as a husband and a father you feel. Like, you know what, really, we ended up here? You know, the place where you're not only the, the occupant of the room, but there's other creatures in the room? Uh, and you know when there's a, a sign at the jacuzzi? You know, that not only lists things about diarrhea and other diseases, but it goes on and you're like, I don't even want to go near that, that death trap thing called a jacuzzi. You know, you're just sitting there going, Man, God, really? And, and your wife puts up with it and your kid put up with it and you're just inside going, but I want something better for them. This is Joseph, right? Like, I want something. She's about ready to deliver the son of God. He deserves better. Like, and can you imagine even Joseph turning his, his head heavenward saying, this is your kid, right? You did this, and now we're here, and this is the best we have? First point. It's in those places we refuse to go that hold the graces that we so desperately need. What if I told you That Jesus, the Son, the Father, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, planned for this moment to happen because it so aptly describes the ministry of Jesus. Not entering our lives in the place of perfection, not entering the the places in our lives that are clean and perfect and and orderly and, and well put together, but perhaps the ministry of Christ is a place where he enters those, those, those locations of humiliation in order for us to experience exaltation. Could it be that Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 says, He humbled himself and became like us. He has come to identify with us in our uncleanness in the things that are filthy, the things that are messy. And God is not looking for stuff that's polished and put together, but this birth in a stable aptly describes the the life and death of Christ. Because he lived a life where he didn't own uh, a house, he didn't own a bed. Does the Son of Man have no place to lay his head? These were words himself. He dies a death he didn't deserve to die. A, a place uh, of humiliation called the skull, a cross, an instrument of death of humiliation. Humiliation describes the life and ministry of Jesus, and yet he wants us to meet us in those places of humiliation as well. That he enters our world, and until we go to those places we don't want to go, we'll never experience the graces he wants to give. 
Meaning, we must learn to accept the good and the bad. We must accept the clean and the unclean. We must accept the things that we love to share with people, and we must accept the things we don't want anyone to ever know about us. Because the ministry of Christ, where he declares himself to be the light of the world, is able to enter those places of our souls that we have never exposed to anybody else, but he knows, and somehow, some way, his light exposes it until still tells us he loves us and cares for us. Come out of hiding. Don't refuse to go to those places that are just nasty and dirty and allow the graces of God to meet you there, there and to do that healing He longs to do. I mean, does not the Bible say that where we are weak, He is strong? And where there is darkness, there is His light. When we are dirty, He is pure. When we are unrighteous, He is righteous. When we are faithless, He is faithful. And so the message is this, if Joseph could tell you today, yes, that was the last place I wanted to go, but it was the very place that the light of the world entered this world and ministered to my heart, and and it reminded me that this is not about me. I accept the place of humiliation, and he says to all of us who are shame-filled, guilt-burdened, self-condemning, God is good, God is merciful, God is kind, God is compassionate. These are His graces. Come out of hiding. And while you may not like what people think or say about you, there's a God who adores you. And accepts you even when he knows everything about you. Are you kidding me? Merry Christmas. Maybe you feel like Charlie Brown. Man, I love Charlie Brown. I don't know what episode this comes from. But you know, Lucy, the famous psychiatrist, puts her sign out. Psychiatric help, five cents. I mean, what a bargain, right? Her first customer, guess who it is? Charlie Brown. She says, Charlie Brown, sometimes I feel we are not communicating. You, Charlie Brown, are a foul ball in the line drive of life. You often are the shadow of your own goalpost. You're a miscue. You're a three-putt on the green. You're a 7-10 split in the 10th frame. You're a drop rod and reel in the lake of life. You're a missed free throw. You're a shank nine iron. You're a called third strike, Charlie Brown. You're a bug on the windshield of life. Do you understand me? Do I make myself clear? And you just think of Charlie Brown taking all this. And yet Charlie Brown continues to find hope and encouragement in life. Even with all the Lucys. Anyone got a Lucy in their life? Who just never seems to say the things that are just going to pick us up. Well, God realizes that we're all a bunch of Charlie Browns in a way. You ever feel like a shank nine iron? Oh, I know that truth better than I like to admit. You ever feel like a missed free throw? You ever feel like a 7-10 split in the 10th frame? You ever feel like that? Well, there's hope because God meets you in those places of humiliation so that you can know exaltation and that only comes through the personal work of Jesus Christ. So what do you do in those places? Second point is this. It's in those places of turmoil that God reminds us to increase our trust. I'm going to tell you right now that men and women throughout the centuries have learned something so valuable that it's good for us. They learn to recognize God even in the mess of life. Can I ask you just to make this one of your goals this coming year? Lord, no matter how messy, how confused, how uncertain, how crazy things may be, please help me to recognize you in this. Because don't we become practical atheists at point where we refuse to see God even in the things that are junk? Even the things that we seem are are mistakes. See, you need to understand, wise men and women of every age have handled difficult situations in the same way. They have not panicked because they have sought to find God somewhere in the messiness of life. Each of these examples that I'm going to share with you have learned not only to see God in the messiness, but to trust God in the messiness of life. Joseph, Old Testament, the other Joseph, Genesis chapter 39 through 50. 
The one whose brother sold him into slavery. Hey, that's good family right there, don't you? This is the one who, you know, uh, had an indictment of, of sexual immorality that was false, accused against him with, with Potiphar's wife, right? This is the guy who was in prison and was promised that the guys that are going to be leaving prison before him would put a good word in for him, and they didn't. This is a guy who every step of the way just seemed like, man, this guy can't catch a fair break. And yet in chapter 50, when his brothers are there in Egypt because of the famine in Israel, he says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. See, that's seeing and trusting. See, it's like a guy, Job, wealthiest man who loved God, and yet God allowed his life to experience such incredible tragedy. His children are taken from him. His house is taken from him. His livestock is taken from him. He wishes maybe his wife was taken with, from him, but he, she wasn't. You know, She was the one that said, hey, curse God and die, Job. God is not with us. He's forsaken us. And it, here's Job who says this, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Seeing and trusting. Take, for example, a guy by the name of David, King David, right? This is the guy who, I mean, where do you start with mistakes in his life, right? But there's some things that he couldn't control. Imagine having a son, his own son Absalom, wanting to kill his own dad, David. He's running and running from his own child. And he ends up in a cave and he writes a psalm called Psalm 23 that says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is fleeing being murdered by his own child. And yet he writes those words. Seen, trusting. How about the Apostle Paul, who from prison writes one of the greatest letters of the New Testament called Philippians. And he says to the Philippian church, Consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials of many kinds. Because this too shall pass. Are you kidding me? You're in prison. And you're telling those that are not in prison, be joyful. God's in this. See, seeing and trusting. You will continue to be up against the wall, feeling like life is against you, that things don't make sense if you do not see God in the midst of it. And when you see God, you can't help but trust Him because you have no other alternative. Someone said these words. When confronted with a difficult situation, a person with an outstanding attitude makes the best of it while he gets the worst of it. Life can be likened to a grindstone. Don't miss this. Whether it grinds you down or polishes you depends on what you are made of. Will you allow the circumstances to grind you down or will you allow the circumstances to polish you? It is your choice. But what God permits into your life is not for your destruction. It is for your exaltation. Joseph Joseph will testify of these things. Two verses to encourage you this week. Psalm 84, 11. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who do what is right. Amen? And Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you good gifts to those who ask Him? God is not against you. He's for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? See God. Trust God. So the first blank, did I miss it for you guys? Where is God in the midst of See, I'm thinking there's a voice inside my head saying, Scott, you missed the blank, and people are getting really upset at you right now. First blank, a time of painful decisions. Second blank is a time of perplexing desperation. And the last one now is a time of purposeless directions. Something that uh, has always intrigued me about the Scriptures, seems like God, when it comes to geometry, uh, operates on a whole different scale than what I learned in school. In, ge- in geometry in school, we learned that the shortest distance between two points is what? Straight line. 
not with God. He takes that whole thing and throws it out the window. He says, you know what the shortest distance is between two points? It's a zigzag. All throughout the scripture, you never, you rarely see God taking person from point A to point B in the most efficient, the quickest, the shortest way. You see God taking people all over the place. How long did Israel wander in the wilderness? How long did they wander? 40 years. Do you know that this is like a three-day journey from where they started and where they need to go? Three days! And how long does it take them? 40 years! You, you ever feel like that, you guys? A, a line drive, foul ball, and the thing of life? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. So here's Joseph. Two years now in Bethlehem. I'm going to show you a map. Can I just pull up this map real quick, if you would? All right, so check this out. So we started in Nazareth. Right? They're planning the wedding. Mary comes with the news. Joseph doesn't know how to process this. Then the census happens, right? Do you think it was an accident that Augustus decided to do the census and send everyone home to their places of ancestral history? So you have to realize that the Messiah needed to be born in Bethlehem because this was the Old Testament prophecy, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. So just as you thought this was an inconvenience to your life, right? Like Joseph's going, great, what am I going to do for work? What about the travel expenses? What about my wife who's advanced in pregnancy, right? But God's prophecy is going to come fulfilled, right? He needs to move Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So they take the 100-mile journey, 8 to 10 days. They get to Bethlehem. She gives birth, right? In Bethlehem, they go to Jerusalem. Now see the little circle there with two and three near it? They go to Jerusalem for the circumcision of Jesus on the eighth day. And then after the 40th day, it's a day of, of dedication. So they spend time in, Beth, uh, in Jerusalem. There they meet Simeon the prophet. There they meet Han Anna the prophet. And they bless them in Luke chapter 2. Then they go back to Bethlehem. Guess how long they're in Bethlehem? Two years. This is when the Magi come from the east. And they come to see, so Jesus is this two-year-old toddler, right? There they are in Bethlehem. Joseph is getting his feet planted. Mary's getting her feet planted, right? He's got somewhat of a job. They've got somewhere in a home. They've moved out of the stable. Isn't that good? So they're no longer in the stable. That's why in Matthew, if you go to Matthew 2, turn there if you would, and, and look at these verses, it says that the Magi come and they meet them in their house. So they're no longer in the stable. Verse 11, and they came into the house and saw the child and Mary. These are the Magi. Now these were wealthy kings from the east who have studied the stars. They're astronomers. They understand the constellations. But they've come to worship the one who's going to be born king of the Jews. But before they got to Mary's house, remember where they ended up? They ended up in Herod's palace. Hey, we've come to worship the king. And Herod's like, I'm the king. No, not you. There's another king. And all of a sudden, Herod's like, what? And he issues an edict for every child under the age of two to be slaughtered. The magi come, visit the Christ child, bring their gifts. And then an angel appears to Joseph. Verse 12. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Now notice this, verse 14, And they arose and took the child and his mother and departed for Egypt. Okay, wait, wait, wait. They're in Nazareth, then they're in Bethlehem, and now they can't go back because of Herod's edict. they got to go to Egypt. Now we're not talking about like Phoenix to Tucson. Now we're talking Phoenix to Hermosillo, Mexico. We're leaving our country. We're going to a place perhaps we've never been before. So Joseph's going, okay, here we go again. Another hundred miles. So now they're taken off this map and they go to a foreign country. Joseph's thinking to himself, how do I feed my family? How do I house my family? What do I do for a job, right? And all of a sudden we're reminded of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, where the, the Bible says, God says, the king's heart is like a river of water in my hand. What Joseph is keying into here, even though he may not like it or accept it, is the fact that even earthly governing authorities are under the influence of God. 
He controls the hearts of the kings. And there's a reason why these kings commit the edicts and the decrees that they do. It's all part of God's larger plan. They go to Egypt. Why? So that Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 could be fulfilled where it's a prophecy through Hosea that says, and I will call my son out of Egypt. So not only does the baby Jesus need to be born in Bethlehem, but somehow now the family needs to get to Egypt so Hosea 11 can be fulfilled. So here's Joseph going, okay, we've gone 100 miles here, now we're going another 100 miles here, and then eventually they hear that it's okay to go back, so they go back to Bethlehem, which was their last home, and then an angel says, Herod's dead, but his son's taken over, and his son is worse than the dad. You don't want to go back to Bethlehem. So where do they go? Back to Nazareth. Full circle. You ever, you ever been on a journey in life with God like this? Where you just go, okay, I thought this was the next step. I thought this was the next destination. I thought this was the right route. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you don't know Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, write it down. Because here's what it says. In man's heart, he establishes his plans, but the Lord establishes your steps. Proverbs 16, 9. If you have not written down this verse before, memorize it. Write down Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, where the Bible says, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and God's ways are different than our ways. Can we just all be big girls and boys right now and go, boy, how often God has to disrupt our plans. Because in the end, ladies and gentlemen, this is not about what you want. This is about what God wants. And there's two truths I want to encourage you with this morning. Number one is this. God's plans are never about where you're going, but who you're following. Okay? This is not about destination. This is about relationship. This is not about, there's my goal, that job, that education, that relation. The goal is your relationship to the Father. And I'm going to tell you this, and you've heard me say this before. While God may, may never give you answers, God will always give you himself. Bank your life on it. I've looked at my life and I thought to myself, this is crazy like how God has orchestrated things rarely to what I've planned, rarely to what I've established, rarely to what I want, yet God has proven himself faithful, what? Not in telling me where we're going, but reminding me of his ever-constant faithful love for me. So be encouraged that God may never tell you what's going on, but he will always give you himself in relationship because in the end, that's what's ultimately important. And secondly is this. Be careful of planning your ways without allowing God to first plant your steps. There is nothing wrong with preparing and planning and dreaming. But don't forget about the most important part, and that is the daily obedience you have for God to plant one foot in front of the other. How can God give you more when you have yet to be faithful with the little? Amen? See, what we have to remember is it is always fine to go before God and pray and dream and ask, but never lose sight of what you want in light of what He's calling you to do right here, right now for His glory and your good. Your ways come second to Him planting your steps in a walk of obedience in a walk of sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, even Paul says this, we pray to keep our lives in step with the Spirit. Can we get to a point where every step we take is directed by God? I believe so. But when we mess up and we don't do it, that's where we fall back, not on our ways and frustration and anger, but joy in the fact that God says, let's get back up and get going again because I love you and I know you love me. Amen? So what can we learn from the life of Joseph? A lot, a lot of stuff. I hope we've been able to fill in some of the blanks. The Christmas narrative has now been made more full and complete. Why? Because we've been encouraged. Because here's a man who was confused, who was frustrated, who was angry, who had experienced a lot of different things. But in the end, what did he always do? He always obeyed God when God asked him to obey. And that's the thing for us today. 
I don't know what God's asking you to do, but the one thing that God wants is your obedience that is so knit to a relationship with him. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you know, uh, you, you know what's going on with each and every life here today. You are so intimately acquainted with our lives and where we're at and what we're wrestling with and what we're struggling with. And Father, what's amazing is you are so awesome and huge and powerful and sovereign that you care for each and every single one of us. May our hearts be overrun with joy and emotion from the fact that we are loved by you in Christ and may we seek nothing else but to obey you in life. Even when things don't make sense, Father, help us. Give us the strength and the wisdom and the tenacity to do that. Lord, may we learn from the life of Joseph and may we continue to allow you to direct our steps. And in the end, may our hearts cry be for your glory, for the exaltation of Jesus. And as you meet us in the messiness of life, Lord, we just will declare that you, God, alone are awesome. Thanks for loving us, for giving us this time, and we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. Have a great Sunday, you guys. We'll see you soon, all right?